Whosoever on the night of the Nativity in the great snows shall fare forth bearing a succulent bone for the lost and lamenting hound, a wisp of hay for the shivering horse, a cloak of warm raiment for the stranded wayfarer, a bundle of fuel for the twittering crone, a flagon of red wine for him whose marrow withers, a garland of bright berries for one who has worn chains, a dish of crumbs with a song of love for all the huddled birds who thought that song was dead, and divers lush sweetmeats for such babes' faces as peer from lonely windows to him shall be proffered and returned gifts of such astonishment as will rival the hues of the peacock and the harmonies of heaven. Though he live to a great age, when man goes stooping and querulous because of the nothing that is left in him, yet shall he walk upright and remember as one whose heart shines like a great star in his breast.
spread the azure canopy of heaven and make it twinkle with these spangs of gold. To stay this weighty mass of earth so even that it should awe, and not should it uphold. To give strange motions to the planets seven, or Jove to make so meek, or Mars so bold. To temper what is moist, dry, hot, and cold, of all their jars that sweet accord are given. Lord, to thy wisdom naught is, nor thy might, but that thou shouldst thy glory laid aside, come meanly in mortality to bide, and die for those deserved eternal plight. A wonder is, so far above our wit, that angels stand amazed to muse on it.
Music on Psalm. There was an older man, we'll call him corduroy pants on one side, and then a pretty girl, let's go with tight turtleneck on the other, and he stood between them listening. Sometimes he closed his eyes, and sometimes he wanted them wide open. He wanted to see the music. Corduroy pants and tight turtleneck were so close. If he really wanted to, he could touch them both at the same time. All he had to do was extend his arms to a capital T, and that would bridge the gap. He knew you weren't supposed to do that. There were rules. You had to sit quietly with your hands folded, or maybe your hands at your side, or maybe with your fingers knitted together. You stood when everyone else stood, and you sang when it said, all. (laughs) It was okay to curl up the program into a kind of tube and hold it in your fist, but it was not okay to look through that tube like a (laughs) mini-telescope. And you definitely were not supposed to randomly reach out and start touching strangers. The choir was going full tilt now. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful, triumphant. And the organ rumbled underneath, making its ancient sound. A hum, a hum, coming from somewhere deep inside one of those massive pipes. He imagined a pure vibration, a wave rising up from the bottom of the sea with a quiet, barely perceptible internal noise you can hear only in silence, only in the absence of everything else. Hmm. He thought of the hum inside the head and then inside the helmet of an astronaut staring down at the planet as he reaches for that special wrench designed to fix the special panel on the outside of the space station. He wondered, did everybody catch that sound in the same way? Choirs. Where did these people come from? (laughs) What did they do with the rest of their lives? The matching blue robes, the neat haircuts, all those sensible shoes and choir directors. Obviously, there were no rules for their hands. They could do whatever they wanted. (laughs) Choirs, the separate but altogether vibe only they can pull off. It was a little too perfect. They were probably hiding something. (laughs) Maybe the choir was really something else. A group of escaped white-collar criminals, maybe. A bunch of tax cheats on the run from Revenue Canada making their way the only way they know how. The Christmas concert series was a money-laundering scheme. (laughs) That's why the tickets were so expensive. (laughs) Or maybe they worked for the other side and they were instead a crack team of Secret Service agents sent here to protect the community. They blended in. Of course, they blended in. They tried to look harmless and artistic and sincere. But if a crisis came, if the moment of truth arrived, perhaps they would fling off their robes and reveal their true selves. And then, like a pack of ninjas, they'd whirl into action and attack in dizzying patterns and lethally choreographed sequences. The forces of evil, the stark forces of evil that lurked always beneath the placid surfaces of South and Halifax, those particular forces of evil, they would quake in their penny loafers. (laughs) And they would turn and run. He breathed in through his nose and out through his mouth. You could think about anything here. Your mind could go anywhere. It was nice to have traditions. It was nice to have this spot to come to every year. What else was there? The quarter chicken Christmas dinner from the restaurant he liked? He thought it was getting smaller every year. (laughs) Sure, sure, it was still a quarter of a chicken, still the same fraction, still the same parts, but he thought 
they came from a smaller chicken now. And they weren't giving out the free chocolates at the end. When the phone rang at home, there was never anybody on the other side, just a recording from a robot at a bank telling him he'd been pre-approved, pre-approved to take on more debt. The people at work, everybody complaining about everything all the time, the hiss and the honk of traffic, kids on the bus with wires hanging from their heads and static roaring from their ears, young couples on TV always ready to grab a sledgehammer and bang through their own walls. <laughs> noise everywhere, everywhere noise. But then this, one spot, enough room to stand or to sit between corduroy pants on one side and tight turtleneck on the other. C.P. had come with his wife, nice haircut. And T.T. with her friend, maybe her sister, they looked similar. It felt good to be here with them, to hear what they were hearing. The sound again, the wave coming up from the bottom of the sea or down from outer space. The separate but together choir, pulling everyone along, pulling them all forward, carrying everyone to someplace else, somewhere a little bit better, just higher and cleaner, a little bit more clear. And then it ended. And the quiet came back. He turned. And he looked at old corduroy pants himself right in the face. Their eyes locked, and they nodded at each other the way men do when their eyes lock. <laughs> And then he felt it, a hand on his elbow. He pivoted to the other side, turtleneck's teeth, they were perfect, and she smelled like summer, like spring. Don't you just love them, she said, and she waved her arm in a circle that seemed to take in the choir and the whole crowd. I'm such a sucker, she said, I know, I fall for it every year, but I love it, I love it so much.
My family, like many New York Upper West Side Reformed Jewish families in the 1950s, celebrated both Hanukkah and Christmas. We celebrated the two holidays in separate rooms, Christmas in the living room and Hanukkah in the kitchen, so that we wouldn't get them mixed up, I guess, or to perhaps to prevent contamination. <laughs> in the kitchen on a baking sheet so the candles wouldn't drip on anything was the gold-painted tin menorah I got at Sunday school. I loved lighting the orange Jewish candles and saying the blessing, mainly because it was the only time I was ever allowed to get anywhere near fire. In the living room, presents were piled under the piano until Christmas morning, even for dedicated assimilators like my parents, a Christmas tree would have been a bridge too far. <laughs> On Christmas Eve, over the presents, my mother would play Christmas carols while I sat beside her on the piano bench and sang along, often mystified by the strange, incomprehensible lyrics. The two weeks before Christmas were the busiest for my father. He would open his jewelry shop on 61st Street and Lexington Avenue at 8 a.m. and stay until the last customer finished shopping at 9 or 10 that night. This made my father's Christmas shopping for my mother a bit of a challenge. So every year, for an, an hour or so, my mother would hold down the fort at the shop while my father hurried out to get her gifts. The year I was six, about to turn seven, it was decided that I could go along with my father while he did his shopping. It was a cold, late afternoon. As we walked east on 61st Street and turned down First Avenue, in the middle of the block was a small red brick church. Behind a low, wrought iron fence was a garishly lit nativity scene. Music was playing, O oh, Come All Ye Faithful, or something similar. We stopped. The nativity scene reminded me of the dioramas I loved at the Museum of Natural History with cavemen and wild animals. My memory of the nativity scene is vivid because it was my first. It included life-size statues of the standard three humans, and more exciting for me, a cow, a sheep, a goat, and real straw and hay. Why are they in a barn? I asked my father. I took my earmuffs off so I could hear his answer. It's all they could afford, he said. Well, how should I know? Let's get going. It's cold and it's getting late. Isn't it smelly? We had recently visited my mother's cousins in Connecticut, and they had taken me to a farm where you could pet the animals. What had most impressed me was the smell. Don't the animals go to the bathroom right there? <laughs> yes. No, they probably go outside. Let's hope so, at least. <laughs> That's Jesus, I said, pointing to the baby. He was chubby and pink and reminded me of the phrase, tender and mild in Silent Night, one of the songs my mother and I sang together at the piano. The words made the baby sound like something good to eat. <laughs> what are the parents' names, I asked. Joseph and Mary. And those guys in the background on the camels, he pointed to a painted backdrop leaning against the wall of the church, those are kings, supposedly. What are kings, supposedly? <laughs> I meant it's just a story. Did they have countries? Why are they coming there on camels? They're bringing presents for the baby. Where is Santa? <laughs> what? Uh, the North Pole, I guess. Come on, David, let's vamoose. At Lexington Avenue, we turned uptown. In front of Bloomingdale's, we passed a Salvation Army Santa. Is Santa God? I asked. Is he Jesus' father? What? No. Enough with the questions, David. 
Is he Christian? Well, yes, he's Christian. He's based on some saint, the one in charge of presents. Speaking of which, he held up the paper bag and smiled at me. Don't tell your mother what's in here. Is that how we can get into our apartment when we don't have a chimney and all the doors are double locked? Is it a miracle like walking on water? I don't know. Ask your mother. <laughs> he pulled me along as he picked up the pace. Why do we have Christmas, since Santa is Christian and we're Jewish and some of them hate us? Because we're Americans, he answered. His eyes were on the shop. Enough with the questions, David. He looked at me and gripped my hand tighter. It's just a holiday, so we can have presents, understand? That's it, case closed. But Hanukkah has presents. Aye, he sighed, Hanukkah's too long. Doing it all in one day makes more sense. <laughs> Some of us have to work. <laughs> but just then I thought of one of the carols my mother and I sang. Round yon virgin. Hmm. But she hadn't looked round in the manger scene. What's a virgin? I asked as I stumbled after him across 61st Street. Somebody from Virginia, he replied.
flocks feed by darkness with a noise of whispers in the dry grass of pastures and lull the solemn night with their weak bells. The little towns upon the rocky hills look down as meek as children because they have seen come this holy time. God's glory now is kindled gentler than low candlelight under the rafters of a barn. Eternal peace is sleeping in the hay, and wisdom's born in secret in a straw-roofed stable. And oh, make holy music in the stars, you happy angels, you shepherds, gather on the hill. Look up, you timid flocks, where the three kings are coming through the wintry trees while we, unnumbered children of the wicked centuries, come after with our penances and prayers and lay them down in the sweet-smelling hay beside the wise men's golden jar.
from this high midtown hall, undecorated with boughs, unfortified with mistletoe, we send forth our tinseled greetings as of old to friends, to readers, to strangers of many conditions in many places. Merry Christmas to uncertified accountants, to tellers who have made a mistake in addition, to those who have made a mistake in judgment, to grounded airline passengers, and to all those who can't eat clams. We greet with particular warmth people who wake and smell smoke. To captains of riverboats on snowy mornings, we send an answering toot at this holiday time. Merry Christmas to intellectuals and other despised minorities. <laughs> Merry Christmas to the musicians of Muzak and men whose shoes don't fit. <laughs> Greetings of the season to unemployed actors and the blacklisted everywhere who suffer for sins uncommitted, a holly thorn in the thumb of the compilers of lists. Greetings to wives who can't find their glasses and to poets who can't find their rhymes. Merry Christmas to the unloved, the misunderstood, the overweight. Joy to the authors of books whose titles begin with the word how, as though they knew. <laughs> Greetings to people with a ringing in their ears. Greetings to growers of gourds, to shearers of sheep, and to makers of change in the lowly underground booths. Merry Christmas to old men asleep in libraries. Merry Christmas to people who can't stay in the same room with a cat. We greet, too, the boarders in boarding houses on the 25th December, the duennas in Central Park in fair weather and foul, and young lovers who got nothing in the mail. Merry Christmas to people who plant trees in city streets. Merry Christmas to people who save prairie chickens from extinction. Greetings of a purely mechanical sort to machines that think, plus a sprig of artificial holly. Joyous Yule to Cadillac owners whose conduct is unworthy of their car. <laughs> Merry Christmas to the defeated, the forgotten, the inept. Joy to all dandy prats and bunglers. And to you. <laughs> <laughs> we send most particularly and most hopefully our greetings and our prayers to soldiers and guardsmen on land and sea and in the air, the young, doing the hardest things at the hardest times of life. To all such, Merry Christmas, blessings and good luck. Merry Christmas to couples unhappy in doorways. Merry Christmas to all those who think they are in love but are not sure. Greetings to people who are waiting for trains that will take them in the wrong direction. To people doing up a bundle and the string is too short to children with sleds and no snow. We greet ministers who can't think of a moral, gag men who can't think of a joke. Greetings, too, to the inhabitants of other planets. See you soon. <laughs> and last, we greet all skaters on small natural ponds at the edge of woods towards the end of afternoon. Merry Christmas, skaters. Ring steel, glow red sky, Die down, wind. Merry Christmas to all, and to all good morrow.
Imagine striking a match that night in the cave. Use the cracks in the floor to feel the cold. Use crockery in order to feel the hunger and to feel the desert, but the desert is everywhere. Imagine striking a match in that midnight cave, the fire, the farm beasts in outline, the farm tools and stuff. And imagine, as you towel your face in the towel's folds, the bundled-up infant and Mary and Joseph. Imagine the kings, the caravan's stilted procession as they make for the cave, or rather, three beams closing in and in on the star. The creaking of loads, the clink of a cowbell, but in the cerulean thickening over the infant, no bell and no echo of bell. He hasn't earned it yet. Imagine the Lord for the first time from darkness and stranded immensely in distance, recognizing himself in the Son of Man, homeless, going out to himself in a homeless one.
When black and white see eye to eye, good times go round and round. But when they don't, some push, some shout, some fight, all stand and frown. See eye to eye, I always say. See hand to hand. See heart to heart. See mind to mind to mind. Then black meets white, meets brown, meets tan, meets French, meets Mi'kmaq, meets Arab, meets Jew. When black and white sees eye to eye, this world fits and pleases me and you. Jesus Christ is born.